Welcome to episode nine of the Truth and Legend podcast. We have a different kind of show today. We're going to have a guest on the show. Obviously, we have Brandon and Eric, but on today's show, we have a guest. He's coming up to us from Anchorage, Alaska. His name is Evan Vosick, and I've worked with him a ton. So I just thought it'd be cool to have Evan on the show just to get a perspective from a young person that is breaking into the biz. Evan isn't just breaking into the biz, the film biz, which he is, being in Alaska, there's so many opportunities to do so many cool things. He does skiing. He does, he's his own pilot. He has his own plane and he's a pilot and he's getting ready to get his commercial license. I mean, he's done fishing. He's done it all, but there's no one thing that he's doing as an actual job at the moment. He just cobbles a bunch of stuff together. And I thought it would be cool just to talk to him about his path and where he's been going. So before we get to you, Evan, and welcome, by the way. Thank you. Before we get to that, um, let's just catch up with either one of you guys, Brandon or Eric. Do I have anything to add? <laughs> Probably not. You've been sitting on your butt. Yeah. I went out and filmed a little bit, but I'm not ready to talk about that project yet. It's not <laughs> even close to being done. So, Well, Eric, you got out a little bit. You sent us a clip of something. Yeah, I just got out a couple times last week. Just... um the last few winters, since I didn't really get out doing too much birding this year, I decided I'd try and, with the new year, just hit some old spots that I hadn't been to for a while. I mean, I was surprised at some of the spruce bark beetle kill in some of the parks in town. The landscape's just completely different with all the, those big spruce trees there anymore. So it'll be interesting to see how those environments kind of change and different bird life. You know, what used to be a hot spot for woodpeckers and things there's it's completely quiet now and other birds are moving in so we did that checked a couple uh burn areas where we had some uh, small fires in town so we had snowshoot out there looking to see if there was any flecking um from the woodpeckers in their feeding but it looks like it's pretty quiet this year so unless it was just a bad day but that's been about it yeah just trying to get out shoot try out some different camera setups and just see what works so can try and do a little bit more like in the field with um other people and try and see where we can branch out with some of these videos so i have two things you're sounding fabulous by the way with your new microphone <laughs> setup brandon sent yeah, you a thanks piece brandon and you changed the microphone <laughs> and it sounds really good yeah and then uh secondly brandon and i are sitting here in denver and it's been a little chilly we're just whining because we listen to too much media and they just ingrain and make us think that the world is ending. So I'm it's weak. been like minus 10 or whatever. Eric is getting ready to go out. I think in the middle of this week, aren't going to go like Wednesday through Sunday or something. He's getting ready to go on a little adventure with his wife. And uh, just tell us what the high temperature is where you're going. Oh, yeah. The high is uh, forecasted at negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's probably going to be yeah, negative 20 or less where we're going. It's uh, just a friend's cabin that they built like 30 plus years ago, a little homestead property in the middle of nowhere and um, just a cabin. So it's going to take probably a solid day to heat that thing up. Those big logs take at least 24 hours sometimes to get the cabin warm and cozy, but we're going to go out there. We'll see. It's not a bad uh, place to find owls and maybe links or something. So I'm hopeful that we'll pick something up out there, but at the very least, it'll be a nice quiet getaway. And when it's that cold, it's hard to go outside for too long. I've been out there when it was like negative 50, negative 55 and man, that's, it's tough to do a whole lot, but if it's calm and dry, you know, it doesn't usually feel quite that bad. You get in town here and it, you get a cold wind over the mountains with some moisture in it. And that, freezes you quick but i'll try and take some videos while we're out there post some shorts or something and give you guys an idea what it's like <laughs> in that trying is not acceptable you must you yeah must oh yeah i will <laughs> yeah well that's a good tie-in to actually bring in evan into the conversation because i first met evan probably what was that two years ago and i just met him in passing i was on a shoot uh I don't know even who it was for. I was probably for someone I can't talk about at the moment, but we were up in the Arctic and I got a call to, to go up in the Arctic. It was minus 45, minus 50. And they're like, Hey, can you come do a shoot a three week shoot? And I'm like, 
Hmm. Minus 45. I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I'm manly enough to do that. So I did a bunch of calling around and I was like, okay, yeah, I'll do it. And it was actually awesome. When you're out there minus 45, you realize that you can actually survive and thrive and it's not that big of a deal. And then you realize that minus 20 is actually feels kind of warm. But in going out and doing that shoot, I got a chance to meet Evan. And then we've worked together a ton since then. And it's been really awesome. And I just think your story, Evan, is so interesting. What I'd like for you to do just to get it started is just give us a little snapshot into what you're doing right now. And then after that, I have a couple of questions that I think will open people's eyes up into Evan big time. Right now, I'm kind of working whatever film contract I can I can get, uh, mostly through Florian, Florian Schultz. Uh, maybe you've talked about him on the podcast before. He brings me on as as a guide or a, a videographer or kind of like a yeah just an extra hand on any project he's had recently and and I kind of just I've been waiting for those but uh, I'm open to working anything always it's it seems like there's all kinds of options up here. So for the last several months, it's been kind of slow. I mean, ever since we finished up our work last summer, it's it has been kind of slow. So you're doing other stuff too, right? So you have your pilot's license, like I said earlier. Yeah. And you actually have a, a half million dollar Learjet? <laughs> yeah, I have two, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> no, you have yeah. a, you you keep calling it a T. I'm not that much up on the aviation, yeah. but you have a, what you call a T crate, right? Yeah, it's a 1941 Taylor Craft. Um, I just patched up the holes in it uh, last weekend, so now, well, it still gets a bit of a draft when you're when you're flying, and you know, if it's raining outside, it's raining inside the plane. It's it's a bit of a character, but uh, yeah, even if I'm not working, of course, yeah, I would go crazy if I wasn't doing something every day. So I don't think I have time for a job right now. You know, it wouldn't be able to fit it into my schedule. What brought you to the flying? Is that something that you've always wanted to do? Or is it something where you're living in Alaska and you're like, you know what? This seems really cool. Yeah, it's a bit of both. The first flight that I remember was I was a I was a guide out at a lodge for a season and they flew me out in a beaver on floats, which is an old World War II aircraft, uh, really popular up here as a bush flying uh, beast. Uh, they're they're considered large. They fit six people. And uh, I just remember that flight was really spectacular. We got to go into the mountains and I saw bears and moose and I might have even seen a fox or something from the plane. And yeah, it, it stuck with me. That was that that changed a lot. I knew I knew I was going to be flying after that moment. Um, it was just a matter of how one can even get into such a thing. You're how old right now? I'm 25. Yeah. What's cool about Evan is, and we get to spend, we just basically live with each other for months or for at least a month on every yeah. shoot, right? Yeah. So you have all this time when you're out cruising around and you're traveling to other places or sitting in the woods waiting for something to happen or whatever, and you just end up talking. Your burning stuff started a long time ago. Give us that whole story and what you did. And I mean, it's so impressive. It's just fun to listen to yeah, I can't say that I know exactly how it started. I just remember maybe I was visiting my grandfather up here in Anchorage, and he had an Audubon Society bird field guide, and I must have been four or five, and and yeah, I I don't know. I guess I was obsessed. I I I just memorized the field guide uh, over and over, <laughs> and then you know every every bird I saw, I'd, I'd catalog it just in my head and. On yeah, I, I honestly have no idea what what started it or anything. But then I was begging my parents when we were back in Oregon to take me out. And when I was five, I started volunteering at a uh, at a local uh, wildlife preserve, Jackson Bottom Wildlife Preserve and uh, Wetlands Preserve rather. And I would I was a volunteer to take field trips out. So I'd take field trips from from fourth grade up through high school. Uh, from when I was five to 12 years old and, and I'd essentially guide them around the place and show them the birds around. And, and then through that, I got to meet the head of Audubon Portland at the time. And he helped me get on with the reintroduction program of, of certain raptors like barn owls and, 
peregrine falcons in the city and and i got to go and uh, see the shelter and help release these birds and it was a really good experience i had some fantastic mentors um and i just haven't gotten away from the birds yet so can you imagine a five-year-old giving your group a tour <laughs> and you're like have to take him seriously but he knows his stuff so well that you're like oh yeah, okay hilarious. well yeah that's what that is and 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 evan is a phenomenal birder i mean i we we talked about garrett vin in a previous podcast um and i think evan would say that garrett's better than evan but i would say that evan is like right there with garrett as far as finding or identifying birds either through audio or or visual or whatever yeah luckily i, I still have my youth so i can still see unlike garrett <laughs> that was kind of like that got you into the woods Mm -hmm. what got you into well how how did you end up going back to anchorage from oregon and then from that why did you decide to go down this film path because you got pretty hot and heavy into it and it's not just film stuff Evan is not just running a, a camera. The guy is like managing camps, learning how to set up everything, actually doing all the prep work at the at the place in Anchorage where we do all the where all the equipment's at. He has to go in and set up a stove and make sure it works and set up a tent and make sure it works. But then go over and play with the CN twenty and make sure it works. I mean, he's gotta know everything. So what made you think that that was a pretty cool opportunity to pursue as you kind of figure out what you want to do with your life it's somewhat long-winded i suppose i don't want to dominate you guys are all more no please dominate it because we (laughs) have like three hours of a podcast that we want to fill (laughs) good coffee um i was going i ended up going to college uh to study wildlife biology in uh oregon uh, which is where i grew up I always knew that Alaska was home. We had a lot of family up here and I was always up here as much as possible. And, uh, yeah, I started out doing wildlife biology in school and then I got to tag along with these wildlife biologists in the field on their projects with sage grouse and, um, yeah, a number of other smaller projects, but sage grouse was the big one. And, uh, I got pretty frustrated with the way things are managed, um, by, Oregon Fish and Game and uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. It was it was challenging to see all of the money coming from the hunting and the fishing world, and so all of the public lands were managed for such things. Like, uh, yeah, I I I don't know where I got it in my head that it would be a more ecologic focused uh, field, but it's it's all for hunting and. And that's fair. I totally support hunting. I think that, you know, it's a, it's an ethical way to, to obtain meat. I, I really do believe so, but I thought it was kind of frustrating, you know, if we're killing off certain trees that, that are good habitat for owls, because then we wouldn't have enough sage grouse to be hunted by the local folk there. Uh, it it seemed, and they were actively killing predators, bobcats, coyotes, um, in order to, protect these sage grouse but not to protect them for good to protect them for long enough until the hunting season is around and that kind of rubbed me the wrong way so i didn't know what to do Um, in the summers i was working on the fire department in the north slope in in alaska which is prudhoe bay area the north slope is just this big coastal uh plain uh for those that don't know uh it's considered ugly and uh you know, you want to avoid it at all cost by most people up here, but that is, that was my dream. I wanted to go there because there's lots of birds. And so I worked up there for a couple summers and then I hated the way they were treating it there. <laughs> it was pretty sad. Um, and my parents came up to visit one time and they actually took me out to a lodge, a readout mountain lodge for a day trip to go see bears. And, uh, that is kind of when I, changed paths because i really hit it off with the people that work there and they brought me on as a guide the next summer Uh, and i worked there for three summers until i met the national geographic folk that i would guide that i was guiding 
So you, when you were working in Prudhoe, you actually were still in Oregon. You would just come up and work in the summers? Yeah, exactly. I was I was still going to college, so I only okay. had summers available. So I, yeah, since I was 17, I guess I've been working up, up in Alaska every summer. All right, so continue on. So now you've got your job at, and you got to uh, guide a National Geographic photographer. Yeah, so I guided uh, Taylor Turner and Brittany Delph. They were working on uh, the National Geographic film about the the national parks of Alaska, specifically Lake Clark National Park, which is where the lodge that I was working at was situated. And they are the most, they're amazing people. I can't speak highly enough about them. And they tried to get me on... Uh, a couple of shoots. Uh, one in particular that they were talking about was in Senegal. It was a Darren Aronofsky film. Um, later, I found out that was for like the Vegas Sphere or something. But uh, this is in the midst of COVID. So there were all kinds of wrenches thrown in the production. And they weren't able to have any sway with it. I'm not even sure if they went in the end. But they got me hooked up with... Uh, this guy, Florian Schultz, I saw Florian Schultz written all over their gear. And I was asking, Oh my gosh, do you know him? Cause I've been a fan of him for as long as I can remember. I, I, uh, I was an avid national geographic, uh, reader and Florian Schultz has been in there a number of times. And I, I am obsessed with the Arctic always have been. So he had really the best Arctic pieces I'd ever seen still to this day. And I kept asking about him and they, they knew nothing about him, but they were like, well, we'll get you hooked up with him anyway. He's an Anchorage and you're an Anchorage and yeah, you should, you should get meeting with him. And so <clears throat> I finally graduate college and my grandmother happened to be sick and she lives in Anchorage. So I was like, well, this is a great excuse. I'll move in with her and, and help her out while, while I try and figure out my life after college. And so I started hanging out with Florian cause they, they got me his email and stuff. And then we just started, yeah, having some fun, hanging out, whatever, and walking around. And I got to meet his family. And then he eventually asked me if I wanted to be a camp manager for uh, the cold foot shoot that Michael is talking about, which is the first wildlife film uh, shoot that I'd ever been a part of. And I was hired as a camp manager. So that essentially means in most cases, getting all the gear ready and, and planning out the food and, um, kind of, yeah, figuring out what the setup is going to be like. But for this particular case, it had already been established. Michael was already up there with a different crew. And I pretty much just had to step in and, and show up and, and, and cook the food and uh, help out basically in any way that I can. I didn't really much care what I was doing. I still don't. I just like to be outside and especially around cool people like Michael and Florian. So, yeah, then I got to go up to Coldfoot and spend three weeks camped there with with the pilot and the the videographer who uh, was Erin Rainey, and she's yeah, she's all kinds of good too, um, and the producer. So, yeah, we yeah, I knew it was the right fit. I knew I was going to keep working with Florian if if he would let me, and he has for whatever reason. <laughs> oh, well, maybe it's because you know what the hell you're doing and you're actually yeah. good at birding and you actually don't mind a little rough and tough stuff and you don't, yeah. I mean, you just tick all the boxes. And I think that's some of the stuff that we can talk about. So uh, what Evan was referring to in Coldfoot is I was already there. I was shooting for Netflix. I think we can say that. I don't think the program's out yet. And then you were shooting for, was it BBC? No, I was shooting for Disney. I believe the program's out. I honestly don't know what it's called. That's kind of embarrassing. Um, but yeah, it was about caribou migration and, uh, maybe their interactions with predators in this case, wolves. Um, I'm not sure what else is, I, I should watch the sequence, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. So somehow, like, I didn't know Evan at all then I had heard about him a little bit. We had met in Coldfoot in the, some little, there's one little like uh, roadhouse that where you can get food. And I actually met Evan there in passing just for one day. And I was super bummed cause he seemed like a super interesting dude and, and I was leaving the next day and he was headed out into the bush the next day. So we didn't get a chance to really do anything, but, um, we have a lot since then and it's, it's kind of cool, but 
the reason that Florian keeps hiring you is because you do whatever, you know, we're talking minus 45, minus 50. On my camp, when I was there, we stayed down a river and we stayed in one place pretty much the whole time. Evan ended up going back to that camp, then had to move a camp to way up on this mountain and then uh, just did all kinds of stuff. And, you know, most average people would be like, mm, I don't know if this is worth it. And he powered through it all. So I guess let's just get into that. Let's see. The next shoot that we did was that was that the summer Arctic shoot? It sure was. Yep. Yep. So, so that with was the in- summer Arctic shoot. What did you do on that one? Yeah, the 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 cold foot winter shoot as we're calling it was March to April, um, which is still pretty cold up in the Brooks Range. Uh and then I started prepping for the the summer Arctic shoot, which was up on the coastal plain, uh, north of the Brooks Range uh, in May. And that was a little more challenging cause I was there from the beginning. So I had to kind of think how to keep, uh, I want to say it was nine people at our camp at one point. Um, how to keep nine people, uh, you know, the numbers changed. It eventually got down to four or so and, and people were moving in and out, but uh, yeah, keep a whole camp safe and happy and f- full of food for two months. And that was super challenging. I I I can't hardly manage my own diet or <laughs> happiness for a day. So to think about nine people was a lot. It was pretty overwhelming. But Florian was there for a little bit. And yeah, he was getting a, a lot of other things ready. Because while I'm worried about this, Florian is worried about pleasing the producer and doing the permits and all this stuff for another camp of 10 other people on the far Western side of the Arctic. So yeah, I mean, as much as I complain about it, yeah, there, of course I, <laughs> I have a, small potatoes on my plate as Michael would say. Um, yeah. So that was a, that was a filming birds and uh, it was, it ended up being delayed by two weeks because uh, of weather. We had fog and, and flooding was crazy. My, my girlfriend works worked on the same project, oddly enough, but uh, she was working with the uh, oil field, um, and they were working on the ice dams and ice bridges across the way, and they said it was the worst flooding due to ice dams in 25 years. So mm-hmm. there was just a significant swath of the coastal plain that was full of water that typically doesn't see water. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's still cold. And so, yeah, it brought all sorts of challenges and, and we were working with another company. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was intimidating to work with all these famous people that I've heard of before too. Oh yeah. That, well, that was an all-star cast minus me. So we had Shane Moore, who's, you know, I don't know, you go look at IMDb for Shane Moore and he's got like a zillion pages. And then it was Tim Lehman. And then we had uh, Garrett Vin. And then what was the other one that we had? Neil. Neil Reddick. And this guy, he's a legend. He was a total legend. And he's like been doing this for, I don't know, since what 30 years 40 years maybe he had the At best least. stories about like filming what was the big thing that it was the harpy eagle right that he did harpy so much of the and philippine filming. eagle he's basically the first person to ever film both the harpy and the philippine eagle um in the jungles so here's evan newbie to the whole scene of from start to finish right and he's got to come out here for this this cast of characters and try to make them happy so that they can be as productive as possible but he killed it. It was just awesome. And then what happens on a shoot like that? And I think we're just doing this podcast because it's great to hear a perspective of you know, like Evan's perspective from someone that's in their 20s and someone that may want to get into this business and what it all entails. Uh, I think what we should talk about a little bit later and remind me to do this, but you work a lot for free too, right? I mean, just because you don't get paid for every hour. I mean, there's a lot of time that you have to put in just to build the relationships and get your network and all that kind of stuff going. But, um, when, when we, when he finally got to the Arctic and we got everything figured out and he got his anxiety got brought down a couple notches when he finally had the tent set up and everybody was kind of happy and they had all their own tents. And then 
we were there for what? 45 days or something straight. You and I were there for 45 days. You were there for like 46. No, you were there for a lot more. I was there for 45 days. Uh, the day I left, the plane was supposed to come back and pick up Evan right after we left. The weather moved in and Evan ended, ended up having to stay in this camp by himself for oh, is it another seven days or something. Something ridiculous. Yeah. By himself yeah, for seven days. We I, I left a camera with him. So at least if he could do something, if, you know, and after 45 days, I was like, sorry, Evan, I'm leaving. I'm not going to stay with you. You know, you just want out, right? You're just done. And he was done too, but he had no choice. He had to pack up the camp. We got it all packed up minus one tenth, I think. And then, then he had to suck it up and it started snowing on you and all kinds of stuff. We got there in the snow and he left in the snow. So the, <laughs> the Arctic summers are pretty dang short. But yeah. my point to all that is, is once he got everything set up, then he and I would go out a lot together. Evan is a very in shape individual. So <laughs> I would take the tripod and he would carry the camera because the camera weighs more than the tripod. And we would go marching off, whatever, a mile, two miles, three miles, whatever it was to wherever we were going that day to film. And we had blinds set up throughout the, throughout this place where we were at. So we knew where kind of a location that we were headed to. And then he would get me out there and sometimes leave me out there and go back to camp or he would stay with me. But the point of the whole thing is, is he got a chance to play with and actually shoot the CN20 and the red and all that kind of stuff. So what is that like having that, you know, I don't think you get those opportunities unless you're willing to put in all the hard work of, you know, doing all the camp stuff. Right. And, and what is your feeling about getting the opportunity to actually rub shoulders with those, that cast of characters, but also being able to shoot the cameras and just get uh, some sort of introduction into filmmaking. Yeah, it was really special. There's, I, I learned just so much from, yeah, you and Shane, especially, and of course, Florian now, now that I've gotten to spend time with him. But yeah, you and Shane really took me under your guys' wing. And yeah, Michael acts like I was carrying the heavy stuff that I wasn't even Michael. Michael is always carrying the heaviest thing. He, he insists on it. Um, so don't listen to him there. But no, it was really special being being with such amazing, respected crew. I I've been a fan of of all of these people. For as long as I can remember, I mean, I knew them. I when I saw the list of people that I was going to be going out with, I, I didn't know if I should quit or, or if it was an accident that they asked me to join. I, it didn't make sense to me. I, I mean, I have prints of Tim, and uh, that was like my Christmas present one year, and and then like Shane Moore, of course. I I knew him from Planet Earth and Planet Earth Two, and and then the the, the Snow Leopard sequence. Um, and then Michael, I, I've just heard a bunch about him from Florian, and he was up in the Arctic as well. But And Neil, yeah. But yeah, either way, Michael and Shane were especially generous and, and let me play with the camera whenever I whenever I wanted. And, and even sometimes when I didn't want, they'd make me do it. And it was, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's no other way. You know, typically the, you hear about these things being safeguarded and kind of gatekeeped. And no one wants to let anyone use their gear because... It's not terribly hard to use, but there's a couple of little finicky things about it or something, and, and it, it it's intimidating hearing, oh my gosh, a red camera and a CN20. Um, but, but Shane and Michael really showed me, no, it's just a camera, and in fact, it's a lot easier to use than any of the cameras that I, was, I had been shooting on, like my little SLR, my mirrorless uh, video for years. And, and then when I started using these big fancy cameras, I realized that it's so much better and easier and it, it just makes sense. Everything you want is there at your fingertips and it just felt so natural. But I had been thinking about filming kind of the wrong way. It's, it, it, it they really enlightened me and, and showed me that it's about the story and creating a sequence. It's not just about this beautiful shot. I was coming at it from a stills background and, and yeah, I just really thought long and hard about how you can make a story with, with film. I got this one picture where we found this really obscure duck. So it was a, what is it? Spectacled eider, right? No, is that Stellar's right? eider. Stellar's, Stellar's eider. 
Yeah. And it was like, not, well, tell me, Evan, is it totally uncommon or was it, it, it was a possibility, right? It wasn't like it was, it's like no chance in, in hell that this thing's going to show up. There was a chance, but the chances are going to be pretty dang slim, right? Was that the yeah. case? Not, not in my mind. I did not think there was a chance. You know, I've heard about these things further west, but yeah, I, I guess I didn't even think about it. It just seems like a mythical creature in my mind. So yeah, I had, I, I really was not expecting to see it, especially because we hadn't seen really any other eiders. Yeah, we had seen some uh, king eiders up in. Yeah, Cabo, at this point nothing... we had seen some key kings. But that not at our camp, which was probably, what, 140, 150 miles away from Prudhoe. Yep. So anyway, uh, we find this eider, and someone else found it. We were all sitting at camp, and we watched this other person pursue the chance to try to get a good shot. Ended up getting a decent shot, and everybody was high-fiving because this was like, oh, man, we got something that really nobody ever thought we'd be able to get, right? Well, it turns out that this thing hung around for, I don't remember what it was, probably a week or two. <laughs> and so Evan and I got our chance to get out there and, and get set up and come into a little uh, pond that we kind of knew that this little, this bird was frequenting. And, and so we got there and we were super, and Evan is super excited guy anyway. I mean, just any chance he gets to be with wildlife, he's like, you know, just the biggest cheerleader on the planet, right? So we get out there and here comes this bird and lands and we, we film it and we're like super jazzed and, and I got plenty of footage. I mean, you're getting all the same stuff, right? So I'm thinking, okay, well, I got everything I got. So I'm like, dude, here you go. You run the camera and you shoot whatever the heck you can shoot. And I got the, the biggest shit eating grin picture <laughs> of Evan that you could imagine because he's out there shooting this bird that is pretty obscure and, and totally like random to see where we were at, which uh, being a birder, he's super excited. And then he's sitting there running the red with the CN 20 that could potentially get used. I mean, we don't, nobody knows if he shot it or I shot it. We don't turn it in that way. So some of his shots could get used, which, so I was just letting, when he was shooting, I said, uh, Hey Evan, I just yelled at him and I took a picture with my phone and I'm going to put it in the show notes. You have to go check the show notes to see the picture. Cause he's got the biggest, <laughs> biggest grin on yeah. the, on the planet on his face. No, that was that was a formative moment. I yeah, I remember that. There was a rainbow there and I I got some some phone photos probably of Michael sitting there in the middle of the rainbow above him and and the the stellar zider in the in the shot as well. It really felt like something was happening. It was too cool. So I hope these these stories are interesting. I mean, they're certainly fun to talk about with Evan and I because we just relive it all, but hopefully these yeah. are interesting to the listener out there. Um, how did you get into photography then? Because when we would go out, we would talk a lot about you just knew every camera. You knew – you obviously understood photography. You understood exposure. You understood ISO. You understood all that stuff. You were always carrying a little point-and-shoot with us when we were out. Not a point-and-shoot. I don't know what exactly the camera – it was a Fuji, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, point and shoot. That you were carrying. But um, he knew all that stuff. So how did you learn that prior to, because I think you did a lot of that when you were still in Oregon, right? Oh, yeah, totally. So when I was in high school, we'd always come up to Alaska and, and visit family. And I would make my family go to Denali with me or something and go look for wildlife. But I was very much a binocular or spotting scope kind of guy. I actually resented photography. I was like, my brother was into it. My little brother, he was much smarter than me, but he's my little brother. So I had to resent it. And he was taking pictures the whole time. And I just was like, ah, oh, it's taking you out of the moment. What are you doing, man? You know, you're wasting your time. And then we'd get back to town and and my brother was like, oh, yeah, we saw this, this, and this. And I'm like, no, we didn't. What are you talking about? And then he'd show me the photos. And I'm like, how did I forget about this? And how did I forget about that? And I was convinced. And so, you know, I instantly sold all my Legos and, <laughs> and bought bought a camera, <laughs> you know, whatever I could afford. It was, a, it was a, a, one of those EOS M, the Canon EOS M, their first iterations. It, it, and I... Yeah, it was it was garbage. I had to use manual focus because the autofocus was so bad, and and I was trying to do birds in flight. I didn't know what I was doing at all. But uh, 
yeah, it kept getting me out there. And that I really appreciated. And I knew that I wanted to keep doing that. So, so I just kept sticking with photography over the years. And as I got better jobs and, you know, I, I stopped eating out. You know, all my friends in high school go to Taco Bell or McDonald's or whatever. I'd stop going and doing that stuff for a year so that I could afford this lens or whatever. And and it worked. And then once I started working in Alaska and making more money, I bought nicer gear and I justified it because I was in cooler places. And it just it was a it was a snowball effect. I yeah, I'm I'm even worse now. Um, but yeah, it was it was all stills, all, all birds and stuff. And, and then, uh, I realized that there is, I was getting lucky and getting some good deals on some of these cameras. And, and so then I'd, I'd want to check out another camera. So I'd just sell my camera that I, that I bought for a good deal and I'd sell it for more than I bought it for. So I was like, well, why don't I just do this? And so I, started buying Canons and Nikons and Sonys and whatever else they were and playing with them and seeing what I could do and then selling them ideally for more than I bought them for. Sometimes that didn't work out that way, but for the most part, I got pretty lucky and it let me learn all the different systems. And then when I was a guide out at, out at uh, the lodge that I worked at, I got to help all these other people with their camera gear, no matter what brand it was and ended up being kind of helpful that way. And it just kind of, yeah, made me less intimidated by different camera gear. So it's all it's all the same in the end. But yeah, that's kind of how I got into yeah, that's it. That's really cool. <laughs> how yeah, long did it, it take you to figure out that everything was the same? It, it probably the third uh, <laughs> brand that I used. You know, like because Canon, yep. you realize oh these Canons they each have a little bit different menu systems and stuff and then nikon i was like oh this is so scary but then but then when i got to one more and saw that it's oh wait it's actually all the same just in different order you know then it made it all way more approachable and and you realize that it's all doing the same thing and it ends up being that the photos are pretty much all the same too it doesn't really matter what gear you have i mean it yeah. it totally does it does you know? but it doesn't yeah yeah it does but it doesn't especially to me like i wasn't selling these photos you know i would occasionally do a wedding or a senior photo shoot or something like that but these people aren't analyzing the photos that closely anyway and it just really didn't matter to me what what quality the photo was in i i just appreciated looking and seeing oh see i saw stellar zider and so i could brag to people well and maybe you should explain like why stellar zider is like so because they're endangered still, last time I checked, right? That's a good question. Um, are they endangered? Hold on, let me check. Let me yeah, they, they they might be threatened. Okay, I'm sure so there's... They are, they're still endangered, it says. Okay. All right. Since 1997. Yeah, yeah their population has declined dramatically, and they're a spectacular bird. I mean, it's pretty much as simple as that. They're just spectacular and they're known to be elusive and they live in the Arctic and yeah, there's nothing that matters more to me than the Arctic environment. You know, I, I feel like they're just, yeah, they embody that. Well, and that was kind of the point of that piece, right? Was the Arctic, the importance of the Arctic to those birds. Yep. And from around the world. Yeah. I mean, exactly like they all go there yep at some point yep. it seems like yeah. yeah it's important to the whole world and and you know these backyard birds that you see in colorado or in oregon or in south dakota or in southeast asia or in northern africa you know like that they they all breed in the arctic and it's it's yeah it's it's more than just a local a local thing, a local issue, rather. Okay, so you're left behind for a week. They're like, sorry, the it, the weather is turning. We can't get out there. And so there's got to be that moment where you're like, okay, well, it's bad enough they're not going to pick me up. What does that mean to me? So at what point in time do you get scared and then bored after that, right? Because there's only so much you can do up there. You've been up there for how long at this point? So just walk through that process. Yeah, so I'd been up there for a couple months and... 
Well, the funny thing is really at the beginning of this uh, shoot, uh, I was with, I was camped out with the pilot, just us, the pilot and his, his fiance at the time, now wife. Now he's a dear friend. I, I love the guy. Um, but we were trying to get out to this spot for two weeks and we couldn't <laughs> because the weather was so bad. So I knew going into this that this was not only a possibility, but a likelihood. So I was prepared mentally. I had brought a bunch of books, um, sure. but uh, unfortunately, I'd finished them all by the time this had happened. Um, but either way, uh, I ha- I was out there for yeah a couple months, and we're all ready to go back home and stuff. And everybody else is going back home, but I was actually going to go to a different camp right after this in the Arctic with with Florian and Jake. So <laughs> it, it, it wasn't like I was missing out on home time at this point. So that probably made it a little easier for me. Um, right. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, we saw that a storm was incoming and I couldn't see an end to the storm uh, on my inreach forecast. So we were pushing for Michael and Nicole at the time. I think they were the last flight out. We were really pushing for them to get out. And then the the pilot who was bringing all of our gear in and out, he said, I might be able to get one more flight in today. And, and I looked at the gear load and I realized that it's more than one plane load. So I knew I wasn't going to get out. So I kept my tent up and I got whatever gear organized I could and then I was expecting to be stuck for a day or two. Uh, looking at the forecast, it looked like there might be a window. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, these windows always close. That's just what happens. Um, <laughs> so after a couple of days, you know, I'm looking at, I, I was a pilot at this point anyway. So I look, I would peek my head out the window of the tent and, and I knew that nothing, not, nothing was going to come in. Does that make it but, worse though? Because you're like, you you like there's no hope right the hope is gone yeah. it's just like yep the weather's the weather's here i'm not getting out yeah it's tough to say i mean i remember at this point i was exhausted i remember spending the first you know michael was saying i had set up all the cam or set up all the camp and stuff yeah so i hadn't slept for three days at the beginning of this setup then there were different okay. times you know because like the good lights in the middle of the night but sometimes then it's cloudy during the day so you end up being awake for way more than you ever want to Um, so, and I had spent so much time with all these people that I didn't know, you know, I was kind of socially exhausted as well. There were, there were of course some fantastic people and, you know, I, I really got along with, and and there was some, yeah, everybody was great, but even great people you get sick of, you know, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I, I I didn't mind. I think I got so much sleep. I slept. It must have been 15, <laughs> 16 hours a day or more. Um, and it was fine because there wasn't much food. Uh, and then when there was a little bit of good weather here and there, you know, I'd tell the pilot, hey, it's decent here. He'd be like, well, it's shit over here. So so then I walk around and and I got to see these Stellar's eiders. They had nested in our area and they had chicks oh, and I got cool. to go hang out with them. They were always next to the camp and you know they were tough to find. But yeah, I got to film a little bit of that and and awesome. I got to just play around with the camera and stuff. Yeah, to be honest, I didn't really mind. I just didn't really mind. It doesn't I, sound that bad, actually. Yeah, no, it, it wasn't. I, I think it was worse when it was happening because I would text him because he had an in reach. So when I got back to civilization, I could text him, and you know, and you are kind of bummed a little bit. But yeah. I think in hindsight, you're like, uh, you know, it's not so bad. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, in the moment, I know I was so ready for a shower and for proper food. Because at this point, we were on the worst food. Because like all the good stuff has been picked out. You know, it's two months, and we we had one resupply, but it it was a month ago at least. Yeah, I remember Michael was like, "I just want a hamburger. That's yeah. all I want. I just want yeah. a hamburger." <laughs> yep, always. They even Anytime flew you ask in Michael, a meal one time. Eating. They threw yeah, yeah. in a meal, yeah. which we had a chance of getting a burger, but at the camps up there in the Dead Horse, they don't, it's every night something different. So you just yeah. get what you get. You can't order something. And that night they had spaghetti. So yeah. they brought out spaghetti for everybody. And it was, while well, it was really good and it wasn't something that we, but it's one of those things where, you know what? I could have cooked that out here. We could have brought noodles and spaghetti sauce. And, and we, we did. Cooked that here. 
not just we could have yeah. did multiple nights there's mountain house spaghettis and then we brought i brought noodles and stuff so we had had spaghetti you know like more often than any other meal that one would crave so yeah that was kind of a disappointment and jake knew but you know there's nothing you can do it's buffet style and, and it was you nice get what to you get. Meal anyway yeah i was flying out to dead horse from that spot i was supposed to fly out to dead horse and get a couple days maybe rest and catch up on emails and stuff because we hadn't had service for a couple months and i was going to do that in dead horse before then flying out to another camp um where i was supposed to go film polar bears and i yeah i didn't get to go (laughs) you know that's just a part of it i didn't get to go is what they thought and then I ended up getting a day in Dead Horse. I don't think I got a night, but I got a day in Dead Horse and I snuck a shower in and I got food in. And then, you know, as soon as that happened, like I thought I was going to need a couple days to like, you know, decompress and whatever. But like I got my shower in, I got nice food in, I got service. I got to call my girlfriend or whatever. And and then I didn't care. I was ready to go back out. So it it worked out perfectly. Yeah. And then and then I got to go out and film polar bears along the coast and it was maybe the coolest experience because michael and i i had gotten to spend some time in the blind um alone with a camera because shane or michael would say oh i'll go do this uh, so that i could go to this it was very kind of them and so i'd go film these we were we had a, a couple blinds set up on an arctic fox den um and it was amazing getting to film this this Arctic fox returning to her 12 pups, maybe 13, 11 to 13 okay. pups. We, we could never get a, a firm count. Um, and she'd return with a, with a limbing or a vole or, or a, a mouthful of, of goslings or something. And she would just disperse this food amongst her kids. It was amazing. But filming in a blind is a lot different than any other kind of filming you do you know there's no you can you can shoot wide and and mids and tights but but that's it you know you can't you can't set up for your own creative composition and and it's kind of you film when they're around and you don't when they're gone so yeah so what's on your list so you got like do you have anything left up there in the arctic to that Mm. you have to see i mean you got a polar bear it sounds like so yeah you got your stellar zider well, maybe maybe Eric knows about the gray-headed chickadee. Maybe we'll go and do a gray-headed chickadee. Uh, <laughs> we got to do a gray-headed chickadee trip. Yeah, let's see. I mean, I guess I've I've been really lucky with the wildlife, of course. Um, yeah, I've seen the wolverines and the least weasels and the wolves. Yeah, gosh. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. I could go see a little red crossbill, and if it's close to me, then that's so exciting. It, yeah, I, I, I get stoked about it all. Yeah, Evan's the kind of guy that he gets excited about whatever. There could be a little volt, and he's like, oh, my God, stop everything. Don't move. We got to shoot this volt. Or it could be a wolverine, and he's got the same amount of excitement for it. <clears throat> and I'll have to say that, Evan was responsible for probably, so we had Garrett Vin in our camp, which I think Evan would agree. He's probably one of the best birders on the planet, right? Yeah, he's as good as kids. For for the North Country, for, for the area we were at. But I would put Evan on par with this guy, and, and I learned a ton from both of them. I wouldn't have got half the shots that I got if these two guys weren't there. But Evan was responsible for finding the fox den finding all the different bird species we had to have nests so our our shoot was predicated on getting really quality footage of just the variety of birds from godwits to black-bellied plovers to i don't know the stellar's eider to loons we had yellow-billed loons we had just everything and evan was one of the guys that just basically would just head out. We'd all be shooting something. And if he wasn't shooting, he'd just go out and find it. He found a snowy owl nest. I mean, just an incredible resource, both with the birds. But then last year he and I were out filming grizzly bears on another shoot and or not grizzly bears, brown bears. And uh, just his knowledge out there was pretty amazing as well. So pretty cool to have that kind of background to, to fall back on and, be so young and then just have so much experience to 
to be with you or for me to have him with me was just awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of it is because these guys are all so old. Um, yeah. They just can't see anything, you know, they can, <laughs> they can hardly see their toes. So yeah, you <laughs> spot something, you know, 20 feet away and they're all impressed. Uh, no, of course I only kid they, they're Michael's Michael in particular is, is really good at spotting stuff, but, but you're so focused on filming and, and the camera work that, that you don't have time to, to look around and see what else is out there. And that's really, it's just nice to have someone else with you when you're filming to pay attention, especially when you're in bear country for safety, but, but for everything else too, you know, so that you can, you can see uh, while, while someone's filming this, you, they wouldn't ever notice that a snowy owl is chasing a Jaeger away from a nest right behind them or something like that, you know, for example. So yeah, it's, it's always just good to have I'm going to switch gears on you. What made you get your pilot's license? Because I feel like it's like a natural progression of people that move to Alaska or Alaskans. They're like, yeah, so I moved to Anchorage. I did this. And then I bought a plane and turned into a pilot. And you're like, what? Yeah. It's just like such a far leap. But if everyone has one up there. So just walk us through that. If you come up here in the winter sometime, which you should, and you go ahead and yep. try and drive somewhere. I'll let you go do that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, really, a lot of it, a lot of it is access, but a lot of it is uh, uh, just just ability to spot things from the air. It, it's amazing what you see from a plane, and in all of these uh, high budget nature documentaries that you see, a lot of the stuff is aerial footage from a helicopter. And that's because you can just see so much more and you can move at different speeds than you ever could on foot uh, or with any other vehicle on the ground. Um, and then on top of that, I was immersed in the world through this filming. Uh, I had my pilot's license before I got into the filming thing, but I didn't know what you could do with that uh, until I met these people that, that, that were flying us around. And I realized that not only is it so unbelievable what you can access and what you can see on a daily basis, but it's quite affordable. My plane was $24,000 total and I split it with my brother and it came with floats, mm -hmm. wheels, and skis. Um, and these wow. are bush wheels. So you can, you don't need an airport and it flies at 40 miles an hour. So you can land in, in really short, tight spaces and and if you find a beach somewhere that looks cool just go check it out it's really quick and easy so it's it's super accessible honestly that's a huge part of why i got into it that's awesome yeah. you know uh eric sent me this he sent me this social media thing and actually eric said he can't hear us he's having technical issues so but he sent me this thing of uh, plane drifting. So, I mean, we can totally go out and do that because I film a lot of drift, right? So, it's a natural progression. Let's go do it. No, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, especially this year was a fantastic year for plane drifting because it was really cold in October and the beginning of November, but there was no precip. So, uh, all of these lakes oh. are void of snow. And so, you can go out to these <laughs> lakes and just go drift your plane around. <laughs> Brandon, you show up in Anchorage. And Evan will, from the minute he knows you're there to the minute you leave, he'll call you every three or four hours. Hey, you want to go flying? Hey, you want to go? You want to go see something? You want to go look for wolverines? You want to go see if we can yeah. find a wolf? You want to go see look at some moose? Hey, you want to go flying? So yeah, all you got to do is show up, and he will have you out in the woods. It'll be yeah. it's awesome. And the plane that he has, like he said, is really affordable. Now. The other thing that I think Evan has above anybody else is this other guy that he keeps referring to, this other pilot, is probably one of the best bush pilots in Alaska. In the world. I mean, as in the world, probably. Yeah. And this guy, I've flown with him for, I don't know how many times, probably, I don't even remember the first job. Yeah. Long time. I've known about him for a long time. And this guy, so what? what the benefit to Evan is, is, Actually, the plane that Evan has was actually owned by this guy at one point, too. So there's this all this tie-in stuff, right? Well, and as you can tell, Evan's a really cool person. So he and this pilot get along great. So the pilot will call and say, hey, I'm going to go flying here. You want to go? And Evan, you probably should tell the story, but or any story. But 
Evan's like, yeah, heck yeah. Cause if I can learn from the best, I mean, <clears throat> you figure some of these snow landings, you know, and Evan has to- told me point blank, if they're going to go skiing and if Evan was by himself, he would be very leery to land in a certain spot. But when you have this other pilot, and I guess we can say his name, Jake. Yeah, right? Jake. There's no reason not to say his name. If you have Jake flying in front of you who has years and years and years of knowledge and understands, you know, and he's probably been to most awesome places at least once in Alaska in his plane. But if, if that guy's going to come in and make a landing, then that gives Evan the um, confidence but then also that knowledge for the future when he is by himself. Mm-hmm. So I've always told Evan, I'm not going to fly with you a ton until you have like a thousand hours. You got to have so many hours to be a pilot, right? right? Well, I have Jake hours. Evan has to have so many Jake hours before <laughs> I want to go out and do some random, yeah. you know, snow landing with him because I'll know if he's got that talent or if he's got that experience going out with Jake, then, you know, it's going to be pretty spot on. But yeah, talk a totally little bit about fair. Jake and that whole relationship. Yeah, what what Florian and and Michael and Shane may have been to me in the filming world, Jake is to me with the with the flying stuff. I I don't do anything with my plane or or uh, in landing in remote locations without speaking with Jake about it first. He is just such an unbelievable vast wealth of knowledge. He's circumnavigated the state and then flown everywhere in between. Um, all at 80 miles an hour in his super cub that he made. Um, he's just, yeah, he's one of a kind. He is uh, what I really respect about people like Florian and like Jake is they don't look at anything as impossible. You know, they, they think, well, I really want to do this. I'd, I'd love to see this. And so they go and find a way to do it and they're not scared of anything. And yeah, either way, Jake is just, he he's worked as a commercial pilot for for decades now. I guess not quite two decades. Maybe just like almost almost two decades. He's still pretty young. So he's he's going out everywhere to try and ski or to try and find Florian this or that and yeah, I I can't even say enough about about these people in my life. I mean, yeah. I'm so incredibly lucky. Another thing about working in Alaska is you get exposed to all kinds of stuff, right? So there's ATVs, there's all these different forms of transport. We have this little fold up boat that we worked on that is supposed to these, it does, it folds flat and then you can throw a little electric motor on it. And we're thinking this might be the perfect thing to have in the Arctic because we could actually fly it in on a helicopter. And turns out we didn't use it. We ended up going with the inflatable canoe, which worked out really good. But beyond the plains, which is probably one of the predominant ways, when we were in the Arctic on that shoot, the summer shoot, even the winter shoot, we had one helicopter and two planes all the time. So one's for safety, but one is for spotting and navigation and that sort of thing. So you always have all these things around you where it's like, you know, and you can see why these films cost so much money because it's a lot of money to have those things up in the air just doing all that work that they do. But In addition to that, we had access to get on a boat. So then Evan and I became boat people just because of our job, right? We had to learn uh, how to install stuff on a boat, how to get stuff clean. And I I didn't have to stay on the boat the whole time. And I don't think we can talk about this shoot specifically, Evan, but we can talk about using the boat to to get out there. But talk about a little bit about that because now you have all this experience because you spent what? 50 days on a boat this year or 40 days or whatever on a boat access is always your enemy up here uh these places are remote and challenging um no matter what but but uh yeah you you're gonna have to find some alternative form um to get to get somewhere almost always it's gonna be a plane or boat or helicopter up here and I got to spend a bunch of time on Florian's boat this summer. Um, it's it's just yeah, it's a whole other world, you know. It's it's you have to look at weather in a totally different way than if you're to hike somewhere or fly somewhere or ski somewhere. You know, you just you have to look at things from a different lens. And 
you have to learn how to maintain your own thing when you're in when you're in remote locations whether whether that be a plane or a camera or a boat you know whatever it may be you have to learn how to take care of it because problems will arise uh like you might get a tsunami warning or something <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah either way there's, there's all sorts of things that can happen and you just have to be ready for anything um but but you also need these need these things as as troubling as they may be and the interesting thing about the boat is you just like to go on a commercial shoot Evan and I can't just jump in a boat and say see you later we got this which we would, we'd be okay, I think. I don't know if we'd be as comfortable as some of those old sea captains that have been doing it for years and years and years, but we'd probably be all right. But you can't do that. You have to have a captain's license to to actually go out and do something commercially. So then there's that whole deal too, where it's the same thing as what he was talking about in the Arctic. You have all these people that are part of the suit on this boat and then it's close quarters and you're just around each other for every day. And it's just like, it's like, as much as you like someone, you're like, I just need to get a little space, but I'm like cooped up in this little thing and it's constantly raining or blowing or whatever. And, um, it just is one of those deals where you, you end up learning how to manage people and expectations and all that kind of stuff. And Evan is a pro at that for sure. Say risk, risk management and risk tolerance is always at the Uh, you're always talking about it, always thinking about it because when you're in town doing something, it's just not as relevant because you can always call 911 or you can always drive to the closest hospital. But when you're out in the field, you might be days or possibly weeks away, depending on weather. Everything depends on weather. So you just always have to decide what you're willing to do when and why. And that can be, uh, uh, it can be challenging navigating other people's different risk tolerances because you have to respect it, but you might disagree with it or yeah, it's just, it's, it's really important though to, to understand and to discuss risk tolerances with everybody all the time. Well, in the spectrum, like your, the spectrum of consequence gets more, so if you think of, it's like a log format, right? Where the further you are from civilization, the worse it can be and the yep. faster it's going to be yep. like just a simple thing of like an infection. Yeah. Like a little cut in your hand, right? Like you're cooking, you cut your hand, you get, it gets infected. Who knows what that could be turned. So yeah, it's a, it's a wide spectrum yeah. out there. Yep. You're exactly right. Oh, well, and you did the, what do they call it? The wolfer? first aid so you have that under your belt as well right yeah yeah wilderness first responder course it's it's kind of a prerequisite for any of these guiding positions or any any outdoor leadership or it, it's a very standard common course and it, it just teaches you some of the basics i wouldn't say it's comprehensive but it, it helps me a lot and makes me feel more comfortable did uh were earplugs on the list of things to bring for your sleeping quarters for your your sleeping mate? <laughs> it absolutely was. I put I put <laughs> earplugs on. I didn't wear them myself, uh, mostly because we never really slept. Um, <laughs> it's right. kind of it's it, there's always something going on, especially in the summer in Alaska. There's always light, and it's always last right. light and first light that you care about, but. You're always out all day just in case something else happens anyway. So, yeah. Sleeping. Well, I feel like the lights, like good light lasts forever. It's not like Colorado. Good light here is like 18 minutes on a good day. But there it's like, I don't know, two hours sometimes. Yeah. Or it'll just last all day, like you said. So, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Twilight, I was actually, I was looking this up uh, just because I was curious. Anyway, you know, Alaska is often thought about as like a generally dark place. But on average, including Twilight, I think you we get 50 more minutes of light per day than than the average of the lower 48. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, especially with twilight, of course. It's just uh, like you said, like especially in the winter, you know, the sun kind of just moves mm-hmm. like this. And because it's moving more horizontally than vertically, like at the equator, you just get all yeah. kinds of beautiful light. It's special. Just all the time, yeah. 
Yeah. The whole time that I was in the Arctic, which Evan was there longer than I was, and I think I was there for 45 days. I think it was 45 days. I can't remember. But from the day I got there to the day I left, the sun never set. <laughs> it was so, it's just so awesome, right? And so we ended up shooting all night long. That was the pretty light. When that sun was way down on the horizon, and when it was just getting ready to start start heading back up. So I don't know, we would try to sleep all day and go out at like 9 p.m. and then stay till 5 a.m. Yeah. And it's just. Yeah, we got really lucky with phenomenal. weather when we were up there too. You know, this last yeah. summer with Michael, we didn't get as lucky with weather. And <laughs> although that sun was technically up, you would have no idea about it. You knew the rain was down. So that's really what. Yeah, it was. It's all about weather, always. Well, and that was, you referred to a tsunami warning, but like, to talk about that, because weren't you on a boat when that happened? Yeah, yeah, but we were in shallow water. Yeah. We were in a shallow bay, and the boat right. that we were on doesn't move particularly fast. Um, and and the tsunami, the tsunami can move at 500 miles an hour. Um, so even though it was maybe... 400 miles away or so where the epicenter of this earthquake was we knew that that tsunami could be here in less than an hour um and we didn't have service so everybody else in town gets this tsunami warning on their phone automatically sent through service we didn't get that but we just so happened to have a starlink uh giving us wi-fi and so florian got a call from his wife emile thank goodness and she gave us a warning. And so we all prepared, got in our survival suits and started driving out to deep water where we thought maybe the tsunami uh, wave wouldn't be nearly as powerful and wash us ashore. And, you know, it was kind of a shot in the dark. We weren't exactly sure what the right move was, but we didn't want to go to land because there was no truly high ground. And yeah, and we didn't want to leave the boat with all of our survival gear and stuff on it. But it was more worrisome given that there was a team on land in shallow <laughs> like oh uh, yeah michael was on land elsewhere and we couldn't hardly communicate with him because all we had was in reaches and there's a production crew you have to deal with and and keep them in the loop but also do you want to keep them fully in the loop because they're gonna freak out and call <laughs> someone you know so yeah it was really really challenging scenario to to um, you know decide what to do yeah it's one of those aha moments because they are dealing with everything that they're dealing with and they had starlink which was awesome um i was totally jealous because evan was out there watching movies at night and i'm sitting there you know it's still cool i'd rather watch what i was watching than the movie but um what happened was is they got the warning and then all i get I'm getting ready to go to bed. It's like 11 o'clock or I don't even, you probably remember Evan. It's 11 or 12 at night. Yeah, that sounds right. And always I would check my Zolio before I went to bed. And I see a message that comes through that says, hey, go climb a tree. <laughs> there's a tsunami warning. And there's like four trees in this place. I mean, that are actually climbable. And I'm thinking, mm, I don't know that that's the smartest move. I mean, and you know, when you think of tsunami, you think of Hollywood. I'm not thinking of a, like a four foot wave. I'm thinking of like, there's going to be a hundred foot wave and what is a 20 foot tree going to do, but just hurt even worse. Right. Hmm. So I, there were three of us on the ground at that point and Evan was out on the boat. He was with me originally, but then got pulled out to the boat because of just his, his knowledge and his experience was way better out there than with me. And I just got someone else to come assist me with the producer we had. So I got with the producer and man, there's just so much to think about. Cause you don't really think about it until it happens. And then you're like, Oh my gosh. So the first thing I grabbed were the hard drives, which is probably the dumbest thing, right? Cause we'd done all the shooting and I'm like, God, I better take these hard drives with me because if I do survive, I should have the hard drives so that all this work that we've done doesn't go to waste. And then you're throwing in a headlamp and then you're throwing in a first aid kit and then you're trying to throw in a little bit of food and then you're trying to throw in a couple of extra sets of clothes. You know, you just don't know. You just, I basically just filled up a backpack full of stuff at random because I get this message and I'm like, oh my gosh, we've got to do something. And they're telling us to climb a tree. Well, 
to me, that didn't seem like the smartest move. And where we were at, there was a previous tidal wave that, or a tsunami that did hit there. And then you could see the edge of the trees that it knocked out, which was, I don't know, half a mile away, would you say, Evan? I'd, at least a mile. Yeah, inland. So I right. was like, let's walk to there and get past that limit and see how far away we can get. But then we're in brown bear country. Oh, that's what I was just going to say. I was like, hold on now. You haven't talked about what you were filming out there. And it's the middle of the night. Right. And raining. And it, at this point, it was starting to get dark. So, yeah, it's raining. And then what we're walking through is not just like a field. I mean, it's like got logs and there's deep rivers that you can't, like, you have to wear waders and it's chest waders and you're walking through water and you're carrying They're deeper than that sometimes. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Brandon's been to this place and, and he oh, yeah. went right in. He oh, that's right. In right. To, when he was checking the depth. So, um, so yeah, there's just all those things that kind of play. I learned a ton and I now know that um, you just should have that stuff ready in your tent. I mean, we were safe, and as it turns out, the tsunami didn't hit because we were 400 miles away, and we had Kodiak Island in between us, and it would hit there before it would hit us. So, And then I also learned that I have uh, some friends that live at Kodiak, and the thing to do is just text them. If they're worried, then we should be worried in the yeah. location we were at. If they're not worried, you know, you still got to be on guard, but you don't have to take it quite as serious. And it, I ended up having a, what are those radios that we were using, Evan? They were like marine Rocky radios. Talkie. No, the, I had that oh, marine one. That Sorry, the marine VHF. Yeah, I don't know what kind it was. Yeah, I had one of those, and I was able to pick up the Coast Guard. So we eventually found yeah. out that the tsunami got called off. But After yeah. how many hours no, but- standing in the rain a mile away? Oh, man, we sat out there for a couple hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because they, yeah, I, I don't know what all can be said, but they had a producer that used to cover news, uh, uh, natural disasters. So she had actually worked on tsunamis before and she was particularly afraid. But this was a legitimate concern. Kodiak was, uh, the, the alarms were sounded for a tsunami and the Coast Guard we had called, they were dispatched all over the state in order to respond to uh, various incidents that had occurred within the tsunami area. Um, we tried to call them and warn them about Michael's group that was there, but they said, uh, yeah, we, we've got bigger things, you know, to worry about than we got bigger people. fish to fry. Yeah. So it was, it was scary, but as a result, or I mean, in the end, they, they, the type of earthquake that occurred was not the type that generally causes a tsunami, which is a, a plate uplift or, or something that I, I, I'm not a geologist. I don't know exactly, but it was a different kind of earthquake and it didn't cause a tsunami at all anywhere. So we were all good, but the worry was there and it, yeah, like Michael said, it made us think about all these things and yeah, there's so many, you know, you're, you're so worried every day about, about a bear killing you or a uh, gosh, just the weather being so bad, you know, you don't, you don't hardly think about these other things like maybe an avalanche that could happen or a tsunami or other natural uh, disaster type of occurrences. So just a lot. The other thing that I did learn from that, the last thing that I'll say is uh, we got one bit of advice while we were texting on a, we had an inReach and a Zolio. So we were, we had communication. We just didn't have a Starlink. But after this happened, we got a Starlink, which is kind of cool. So for the last couple of weeks, I had a Starlink, which was kind of awesome. But one thing that someone said is, you know, if it's imminent and if it's going to happen, don't wait to hit your oh crap button, your SOS button on your Zolio till you see if you make it. They said hit that button before it ever happens because mm-hmm. at least they have a starting point for some, you know, for someone to try to find you. If you, you know, and once you've hit that, it's going to keep sending the signals so that they can actually find you. And it made so much sense because, you know, normally you would think, okay, well, if the stuff hits the fan, then I'll just, when, when I'm land, wherever I'm going to land, that's when I'll hit my check or my uh, SOS button. 
but no, to hit that before. But I think is you got to play that game right. You got to know how serious it is, right? You yeah. can't just say, "Oh, I'm going to get stuck in the mountains four wheeling and I'm going to hit this SOS before I head down the road." No, yeah. that's that's not cool. This is just natural disaster kind of stuff where just give your searchers a starting point, right? If it yeah. is going to happen. Yeah. If you heard that Kodiak had in fact been hit, then you would know that it would come to where you are. And yeah, something like that. Yeah. It's, it's challenging to know when to press those buttons. Yeah. So what I ended up, I think I started to talk about this earlier. I have a buddy that lives on Kodiak. So after that, I was like, okay, if we get another tsunami warning, I'm going to text you and you tell me if you're worried, if you're worried, cause they, they get them all the time. They get tsunami warnings all the time. And he's like, yeah, he's like, if it's coming from this direction or if the earthquake happened way down here, he's like, we don't even worry about it because it's what Evan was saying, but they, they have to put it out. They have to protect, you know, the, the coast guard or whoever's issuing the warning has, you can't say, ah, it's, you're probably safe. They have to put that warning out. So we learned a lot. That was a kind of an, that's a good thing to talk about actually. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, glad, these natural disasters are somewhat common. We're in the ring of fire and, and earthquakes are a daily occurrence. And there are stories in Prince William Sound of uh, tectonic uplift of 1,500 feet on, what is that, oh, Hitchinbrook yeah. Island? You know, like that. Yep. It's just, these things can happen and, and tsunamis do happen and will happen. So it's just a matter of time, all the time. Well, I feel like, I don't know if Eric, are you back on? Can you hear us? He said no. Okay. So Eric's out of, he, like, we can all see him. He's just standing there listening. He maybe, can he, he can't hear us, but he could talk or he can't. He can see us. So if you know sign language to teach him sign language, <laughs> he could know what we're talking about. But instead he said he was just going to smile <laughs> and nod along. So, so he just <laughs> smile and he smiles. So if we get really sad. And, yeah. Sad and stoic. Really, he'll have to follow along. So it's a fun game we can play. No, he said he lost uh, audio about halfway through. So, huh? Well, well. bummer. Uh, so, what are last thing? And then I think we can let you go. What are like? What are your next steps? What are you? What are you working on? What's exciting for you? What are you looking forward to? All that good stuff. Um. Yeah, I'm assuming you're asking me. Uh, like, what's I, what's in your future? Yeah, I'm working on my commercial pilot's license. I think that I don't want to rely on these. Uh, I don't want to have to really compromise and take film jobs that I don't want to do because it, it's so near and dear to me. It's really so lovely, but but so are so many other things. I really do love flying and, and guiding. And I think that if I can kind of pick my favorite jobs of each sort, then I will be excited and ha happy. I don't want to work with people that I don't want to work with. Um, and that's, that's the biggest thing I think, you know, it's like, I'm so, yeah, I'm just so lucky to have so many people that, yeah. that are so cool and in all these different walks of life. So yeah, I'd really like to fly and learn how to fly. I simply can't afford to learn how to become a good pilot on my own because it takes all kinds of time and, and money to keep to keep going. And so I kind of need to be paid for it to get good. But also, I I, I think it's just so fun. So yeah. that's kind of my next step. But and when then, you say commercial license, you're not necessarily yeah. going to go fly for United or Alaska Airlines or whatever. You're talking Absolutely about being not. a commercial bush pilot. <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah i mean i i never want to fly a plane that can fit more than six people that that sounds like uh too many mouths uh to complain <laughs> to me no well, no just kidding hold on wouldn't you would fly an otter wouldn't you i would i would kill to fly an otter there's no question i don't think i'll ever be qualified or asked to fly an otter um i think that's just a little bit too much responsibility for a guy like me that's a million dollar airplane or two million dollar airplane that Michael's talking about, and uh, yeah, I, I should never have such a thing in my in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, see, you're being way too modest. You would be fine. Um, I had one thing to add or ask: 
if you could give some young person some advice for getting into the business and I, by the business, I mean everything that you're doing, whether it's, I think in Alaska, what you end up doing is you end up getting a chance to try a diff, bunch of different things. You've been a guide out at a lodge. You've been a guide on a film shoot. You've been a camp coordinator at on a film shoot. You've been a camera person on a film shoot. You have a uh, boat experience. You have backwoods experience. You ski, you do backcountry skiing, you do all this stuff. So with all that in mind, what advice would you have for a young person that's like, you know what? That sounds pretty awesome. I want hmm. to try to figure this out. What should somebody do? Yeah, it's somewhat cliche, but it's cliche for a reason. You know, I say, you know, pick the people. Like I, yeah, I've I've worked as a maintenance guy at a lodge because it's with people that I know and that I like. And I worked on the the fire department for a bit because I, I liked some of the people and that's what's been special about it to me. You know, it's like what it's the job title is, is nice and stuff. You know, if you're like, for example, working out as the camp coordinator at some of these places, I'm hired as a camp coordinator or camp manager or whatever, but if you're with good people and you guys all get along, then they're going to ask you to film. And so you get to, you get, it seems like with these small operations, everybody does everything. So even though, for example, Michael and Shane Moore were hired as camera people, they were doing just as much cooking and cleaning as me, who was hired as the camp manager and, you know, vice versa. Maybe I wasn't doing quite as much filming, but they tried. So, yeah, I just really think that if you meet someone that you enjoy and and you like what they do, then then that's you got to you got to help them out if you can or or work with them if you can. It's just it's all about the people. Good answer. Would you say a prerequisite to working in the Arctic is to be able to work up there for 2 weeks straight without shoes on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I actually don't recommend it. Yeah, toes get itchy, which <laughs> I didn't know about before, but they get itchy and rash. And I don't know. When we got there, it was still snowing, right? There was still snow on the ground. Evan couldn't get into this place where we were camping until like the very last minute, and we were brought mm -hmm. out at the very last minute. We were within one day of canceling that whole shoot because we weren't able to get to where we wanted to go. We got there. There was still some snow. But it went away over time. I don't know. I would say within a week or two, that snow was negligible. And then it got to be summer. And summer in the Arctic is like a snap of your fingers, right? Not very long. But the whole time it was kind of summer, Evan just walked around bare feet. I mean, I'm putting yeah. on my waders every day and I'm wearing my, my hiking waiter boots and and he's out there. He's like, I don't want to mess with waders. I'm just going to yeah. go barefoot. And he walked around barefoot the whole time for, well, for a couple of weeks. And then something started irritating. Some sort of vegetation started yeah. uh, irritating his feet. And Yeah. I had been in flip-flops for a couple of weeks prior. And then, you know, when you're planning on camping for three months, you can't bring three months worth of socks. And cleaning out there simply doesn't get the job done uh, in the sock department. So... I, yeah, I thought it'd be a lot easier to just go around barefoot and it was, and I, I think, I think flip flops are really good though, you know, cause it just that one layer makes a big difference in the end. I've, I've talked about it before on other podcasts and, and on the wild and exposed podcast, and we may have talked about it here, but the one thing in the Arctic that I did not expect was it is all sand. So there's vegetation, of course, right? So you're going to get the woody abrasive stuff, but the ground is sand everywhere you walk is sand. And I always knew where Evan was at. Cause I'd see barefoot tracks walking yep. down the river bars, walking through the tundra. It was just barefoot and you knew Evan, Evan had been there. So um, it wasn't terrible as far as like, he's constantly having to walk on rocks. And in fact, it was hard to find a rock. You just yeah. couldn't find rocks anywhere. Yeah. I it think we only ever found so. coal. Uh, you know, that was the closest thing to a rock we found in this particular spot. Yep. You know, a lot of the Arctic is all bog, but yeah, this area had just all sand and or bog. That was it. So anything else, Brandon, that you want to bring up or anything else you want to add to the whole thing, Evan? 
this has been really awesome. It's been fun to talk about. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, it has been fun. Thanks for having me on. I do you have socials yeah. or a website or anything you want to share with the audience? Uh, no, no. I mean, actually, yeah. I highly recommend watching all the Truth and Legend stuff. You guys should check it all out. It's, <laughs> it's the best there is. Yeah, that's what I'm it's talking really about. Fun. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 fun to. I really like your guys' uh, projects and page. I really think it's it's totally what I've been looking for. I think it's just it's really fun to watch you guys being so natural and, and not going over the top. And yeah, I really love seeing all the wildlife and all the stuff you guys do. You guys crush. Well, we're going to start using Evan a lot more over the coming years. Cause he's always wanted to fly, right? He wants his hours. Yep. So Eric lives up there. I don't know if Eric's going to fit in your plane. I, that's actually <laughs> what I was thinking about. I was looking for someone to fly with me yesterday and I was thinking, gosh, should I ask Eric? Uh, And I was like thinking about it, like I hardly fit in the plane with my six foot two brother. I knew there was no chance (laughs) that I could fit with Eric. Plus, like, I'm not even sure if he wants to fly with some nitwit like me, you know, and some 1941 (laughs) aircraft. So, yeah, I didn't even bother asking. It turned out it was foggy all day anyway. But, yeah, it was it's definitely on my mind. I want to get Eric up, but like, gosh, I just don't know if he can fit. (laughs) We could strap him to the wing, I guess. (laughs) <laughs> so for all you that don't, don't know, Eric, what are you, 6'5 or something? Yeah, 6'5, like 250, so I'm a big guy. <laughs> I had to try and haul around in the plane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's his whole payload for, for that Taylor yeah. Craft. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in that plane, in a Taylor Craft, he's sitting side by side. If you go in a Super Cub, it's the pilot in the front and the person in the back. So with Evan's plane, it's side by side. And then you're on a bench seat, right? That's more Yeah, we share swap. a seat belt. I mean, it's, it's his, Eric would have to put his arm around me to ever get in, but I honestly don't think Eric could ever fit in my plane. I think it might be worth a shot sometime in the summer, but, At but least maybe not in around. winter with our bulky clothes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are you on skis right now or are you still on wheels or yeah. what did you do? Yeah. I've been on skis since the beginning of November. Yeah. I've been out, I've been out and flying. Then, Actually, I, I showed Eric, but, um. Yeah, I got out to fly fly out towards the west, uh, uh, the Alaska Range. Um, this particular section is called the Tordrillos, and got to see a wolf pack feeding on a moose kill, and mm-hmm. and then we landed at a lake, and a martin ran by. I mean, it's it's a really special time because you get to see all the tracks, and we fly so low and slow, you can see them from the air. So if you see something interesting on the ground, you stop and check it out because you can land anywhere in the snow. It's a really handy tool. Oh, one last thing. God, I could have a ten, yeah, I could have seventy five. One last thing, uh, Evan showed up this year at all of our camps with stabilizing binoculars, and yeah. he is a huge fan. Yeah, so you can buy the high dollar Canon stabilized binoculars, which Florian has, which we use, but I don't have any. They're really expensive and they're kind of big. But Evan found some that aren't nearly as expensive but they work just as good and i think it's because being a pilot you're always dealing with that shake right yep. so having that ability to stabilize from the plane is kind of cool absolutely but give us a little of your insight into why you think those are so awesome as compared to just a re- and because you're a uh, you understand optics so whether yep. it's a leica or a zeiss or a swarovski or whatever yeah you get it but you're like a big fan of these Canon binoculars, right? Totally. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I want to say I don't recommend looking through your binoculars if you are the sole pilot of a plane. Um, (laughs) But like we said, everyone has different risk tolerances. Um, But either way, yeah, I've, I've been spoiled. I've gotten to use all kinds of Swarovski glass and, and Zeiss glass and all that, but the glass is so, so close uh, in quality compared to the cheaper models. You know, you're paying an extra two grand for an extra 5% of, of clarity or field of view or brightness. And you don't need that. You just don't need that. But I was thinking, oh, I'll try out these stabilized binos because Florian gave me a pair of his big ones to use from a plane or helicopter. I can't remember. And it helped a lot. You know, you could see stuff from a from the helicopter, but 
it turns out they're they're practical all the time. You know, if you're short winded, then you're breathing heavy and you're moving a lot. Or if it's windy out, then all of a sudden you're moving a lot. Uh, you're on a boat. You're of course moving a lot. So I found that these Canon uh, 10 by 30 image stable IS version two binos, they must be 450 bucks or something online. They're the best binos I've ever used, hands down, um, because they just work and they stabilize, which is so important. I mean, I think Eric and I were talking about it recently as well, maybe yesterday, that like it's the same for cameras, like having something be handy and and not having to lug around a tripod or a gimbal, you know, with all these built in in body image stabilization and these lenses, you know, that's a game changer, too. Like, I really think that that helps you and and makes you use the the gear a lot more because it's it's friendly and it's small you all need to make sure you check out the show notes page for this podcast because i have tons of pictures of evan out in the field whether we're having fun or we're being attacked by jaegers or we're walking barefoot or he's walking barefoot through the woods or whatever it is we've got tons of good stuff and you'll enjoy seeing those those images and uh We appreciate y'all listening to the Truth and Legend podcast. Please tune in again next week.